I have some verses listed to kind of guide our thinking to start with, and I hope I hope to discuss some thoughts that we haven't emphasized much before. I don't hear it widely talked about, and we'll look at some things about Paul's manner, what what is uh, what he calls in Scripture Paul's manner from Acts 13 to Acts 19. We're going to look at who are, who are the Greeks, what the Greeks were, and, and what they were in God's plan and in, in prophecy. And uh, the sequence and order of the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ. Two different gospels. And fourthly, what happened in the body of Christ when people believed the gospel of Christ before the dispensation of the grace of God. Fifthly, last thing here, what about the work? What work was Habakkuk prophesying when he prophesied about the work? Uh, The way I understand the relevant scriptures, for a while after Paul first preached the resurrected Messiah in Corinth, uh, in Acts 18, you can read about it, 1 and 2 Corinthians, but for a while, uh, after Paul first preached about the resurrected Messiah, it, there was a mixed group that believed what Paul preached in the synagogues, as his manner was. Well, what did he preach as his manner was? Acts 17, verses 1 through 3. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. So we're talking about Jews here and their propagation point. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Well, when it says he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, what does it mean? Well, the next verse tells us, Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, that's his death on the cross, uh, he must needs have suffered, and risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. In other words, the the Greek word for Messiah. That's what Paul did when he went to... to, uh, It's what his manner was. When he went into the synagogues in this route, you know, around Turkey and and, uh, the areas around Turkey and Greece, etc. And of those that believed that Jesus is the resurrected Messiah, only some of them went on to believe that Christ died for their sins when, when that was preached to them by Paul. Paul was the preacher of that uh, gospel. And only some of them went on to believe that. Believing that, they were saved. They were part of a temporary mixed group that had come out of the synagogue. They were no longer allowed in the synagogue because they believed that Jesus was Christ. Synagogue was run by apostate Jews. John 9.22 makes that clear. Those who did not go on to believe the gospel of Christ that Paul preached were also part of that same temporary mixed group that came out of the synagogue. But, you know, they were no longer, like we said, no longer welcome in the synagogue. Those two groups can be seen in, in four verses in 1 Corinthians. Let's look 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17, 18, 19, and 20. Starting in verse 17. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. In other words, God called you in a certain way. Uh, we're not calling on you to switch back and forth. <laughs> okay? Uh, verse 18. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. In other words, you, if God called you into, to be a believing Israelite, that's your calling. Don't try to be uh, like the Gentiles. Is any called in uncircumcision? Not as a Jew. Let him not be circumcised. Don't try to be a, a Messianic Jew or, or a law keeper. You know? Whichever way you were called, stick with that. Circumcision is nothing. This is verse 19. Circumcision is nothing 
And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. And this is verse 20, 1 Corinthians 7.20. You can tell this isn't heard much, isn't preached much, is it? Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That was chapter 7. So 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now in, in 1 Corinthians 1 9 we read about God's call for those people to believe the gospel of Christ to be part of the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ. That would be in the body of Christ. That is in the body of Christ. And that call of God was being relayed by Paul in, uh, well, to that former Jewish gathering that had come out. You can see that in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, unto the church of God. Paul is writing to the church of God. That's believing Israelites. So, in other words, they all, all those Jews that had kept the law and just been circumcised and been going to synagogue, tithing and everything that went along with it, except they didn't, hadn't heard about Jesus being their Messiah or even being born and didn't know about that. When Paul came and preached the gospel of God, the facts about who Jesus is, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Well, they weren't welcome in the synagogue, but what were they like? They were like Peter, James, John, uh, Thomas, Lazarus, Mary... Martha, they were like those believing Israelites in Jerusalem. So Paul addresses them as the church of God, which is at Corinth. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with, whether it's a previous call or a call now that he's making, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Both theirs and ours. You can see the two factions, the two parts there. So the church of God that Paul refers to is ident it's told about or identified in in uh, Galatians 1:13. You have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. This is Paul talking so, uh, about when he was Saul of Tarsus. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So the church of God was around before Paul was the first member of the body of Christ. It was not the body of Christ. It was around before that. Paul said, as we read in 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 20, for each of them to obey God's individual call. That was because at that time, God called some of them to go on believing Paul's God. To, 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 in other words, to make another step. After believing the gospel of God, they were to believe that Christ died for their sins. Believe Paul's gospel of Christ to be saved at that time upon belief. While God called, called other people that came out of the synagogue believing the gospel of God, facts about who Jesus is, he called those other people to continue waiting for their sins to be blotted out at Christ's return, waiting for the kingdom, which is no longer at hand. That was the gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom was at hand. And when they, when they fell, they didn't lose the kingdom, they lost the at-handedness, at <laughs> the uh, immediacy of the, the coming of the kingdom. The kingdom is still coming. It will come at some point. And... It's not, it's not a uh, immediate concern of ours because we know that before the kingdom can come, the church, the body of Christ, must be caught up to be with the Lord. So those that were called to be believing Jews, they were still waiting for Christ to blot out their sins at his return. According to Acts 3, 19, 20, and 21, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So when Christ returns, he blots out their sins. 
and it goes on to tell how long Christ must remain in heaven. It says, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Well, Israel is not God's people now. And, and God said, I will not be their God. Well, he's going to begin to be their God again at some point in the future, according to Hosea 1, 9, and 10. And that will be the restitution of all things. When, when Israel does finally receive that prophet that was like unto Moses, whom they, the Bible says they will believe. And they didn't, but they will. And then they will, uh, they will turn their hearts to the Lord when, when the Lord pours out on them a spirit of grace and supplication. And in that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. That's Zechariah 13.1. But none of Paul's temporary mixed group that came out of the synagogue were still apostate since all of uh, Paul's temporary mixed group now believe the gospel of God. Those facts about who Jesus is, that he was the Son of God, the resurrected Messiah. And that's, uh, look, let's look at those verses to, you know, it's, it's clearly defined and identified in the scripture as, as the gospel of God. It doesn't say anything about saving people. This is good news, gospel, good news. Uh, about finding out about who Jesus is, that the Messiah has come. So we're going to read first, um, the first four verses of Romans 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he, God, had promised afore by his prophets in the, in the Holy Scriptures. So, this gospel of God is facts that were promised in the Holy Scriptures. You can find it in the Old Testament, in other words. It says, Separated unto the gospel of God, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. So, he, he comes down, he, he, first off, in verse 3, concerning his Son, he calls him his Son. God inspired that uh, it be written that Jesus Christ our Lord is the Son of God. He's of the seed of David, the, the messianic line, according to the flesh. And verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God. There it is again, the Son of God, with power, by, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Do you realize how uncommon that is? <laughs> I think we all do, but... We brush over it sometimes, but the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> was resurrected, not resuscitated, not revived. <coughs> uh, he was the firstborn from the dead. And Paul never preached the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, you know, I, I can't overemphasize that fact. He never, Paul never preached that a kingdom is coming from heaven to rule on earth in Israel and to get ready for it to uh, you know be whatever went along with being an Israelite that was to be in the land receiving the kingdom circumcision uh, commitment to keep the covenant and the promises and uh, uh, keeping the law all, all these things that uh, went along with the kingdom. Paul never preached any of that to anyone. He did inform the, uh, the Romans when he wrote to all that be in Rome. He did inform them what Israel should have believed in Romans 9, 10, and 11. What would have brought them uh, the kingdom at that time. But he didn't preach. He wasn't preaching to Israel to start believing that it was too late. They'd already passed their uh, the fall. You know, they had fallen in Acts seven, and Paul wrote Rome in Acts twenty, much later. The point is, some of Paul's temporary mixed group, to whom Paul wrote in Corinthians, were saved and in the body of Christ having heard the gospel of Christ and believed it, that Christ died for their sins. While some of those 
in in the uh, in that temporary mixed group that came out of the synagogue were waiting to be saved when Christ returned to reign from Israel, to reign over the world from Israel. It, in Paul's meeting, not just in the synagogue, but in Paul's meeting, nobody in the synagogue was because they didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. That Acts 9 through Acts 28 period is unique in that only in that time, in that period, and in the epistles in that period, are there two gospels, two churches, two commissions being carried out at the same time, and two sets of apostles only during the, that period there. Not today. So, you know, problems about people not believing that there were two Gospels. Uh, you can point to them in the Scripture. They were valid then for that brief period from Acts 9 through Acts uh, 28. And 28 is stretching it a little because they had diminished so much according to Romans 11, um, 12. Romans 11 verse 12. By the time at the end of Acts there, they had diminished so much that uh, it was almost impossible for a Jew to believe. There were some that believed in 28, what is it, verse 20? So, or 24, I guess it is. Some believed and some believed not. Well, those that believed were the last ones to come over and believe the gospel. And uh, Paul was not willing to steal Jews to fill up the body of Christ. Paul was eager to win apostate Jews that God was calling as part of the remnant according to the election of grace. But he left the prophetic remnant to Israel's twelve apostles to disciple, for the, for the twelve apostles of Israel to disciple. So he walked a fine line there, but uh, you know the Spirit was guiding him, I'm sure, just as, uh, as he said in Romans 15, 19. This is a uh, kind of a roundup or a summary of his time in the dispensation of the gospel. Or it's, uh, from Israel's side, it's called the work. Prophesied in Habakkuk 1, verse 5. But he says, through many signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, that's a pretty long way, <laughs> I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ, recall, is, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, well, that leaves the majority of the world out. The rest of us come in after his later sending is in uh, Acts 20, verse 6, as told about in Philippians 4.15. So if you want to check those out, just write those references down and go look at them. Philippians 4.15 describes Acts 20, verse 6 as the only place where it could have been that Christ actually sent Paul. Not the, not the temple vision where he's told that he will be sent to the wider group of, of uh, Gentiles. Uh, the far off Gentiles they're called in Ephesians 2. And then the next verse he says, uh, this would be Romans 15:20. Yet so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. So Paul never violated that verse we just read there from Romans 15:20, and his attempt to uh, avoid preaching the gospel of Christ, the gospel of salvation for today, where Christ was already named, lest he should build on another man's foundation. The Jews believed Jesus. They believed he was the Christ. They believed the entire gospel of God. They just believed the kingdom gospel after that instead of the, the gospel of Christ that Christ died for our sins to bring us into the body of Christ I'm trying to clarify my statement lest he should build on another man's foundation Peter was preaching 
about Jesus, the Son of God, risen from the dead. But he was preaching to Israel, uh, and he would go on to preach about the kingdom coming from heaven, and that they were to be part of it when they were resurrected. So, Paul didn't want to build on Peter's foundation, or for Peter to build on his, Paul's foundation. Paul's manner... Uh, that we read about in in, uh, Acts 17, verses 1 through 3, especially verse 3. As we look through Acts chapter 13, verse 4, through Acts 20, verse 5, we can see those two subgroups. And uh, it's probably most clearly seen in those verses we read at the outset in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 through 20. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to the early church that he had taught in Corinth, according to John 16, 2, that early church had had just departed from the apostate Jewish synagogue. And the apostate Jewish synagogue did not believe the gospel of God, that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Son of God, or that he has risen from the dead. Look at John 16:2. If we could look at that. John 16:2 says, "They shall put you out of the synagogues." How much more plain could it be? They shall put you, in other words, you believers in me, out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh when whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. Paul went into the synagogue, as his manner was in Acts 17, 1 to 3, and he preached to them the gospel of God, which was the very thing that they needed to hear before he preached the gospel of Christ, the gospel of salvation to them. When Paul preached the gospel of God to that mixed group uh, in the synagogue, and then, and then as they came out too, he would preach it in his meeting, Some were called by God to go on to believe Paul's gospel of Christ to be saved, while others others were not. They were called by God to believe the gospel that Israel had been hoping for the resurrection into their kingdom. If, (laughs) If they endured to the end. That's where the enduring to the end comes in, on Israel's side, not on our side. We are saved. Israel is waiting to be saved when their, when their sins are blotted out, if they've endured to the end. Again, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 18. <clears throat> Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. So those con- converted uh, little flock, Church of God Jews were meeting together for a while with the body of Christ believers after they, after Paul had separated them out and preached to them the gospel of God and then the gospel of Christ. Those that believed the gospel of Christ were in the body of Christ, and those that believed the kingdom gospel from having been trained in that uh, but not known about Jesus, they would be in in the little flock group. Uh, the, li- the church of God is probably a better term for that because it didn't involve the apostles in that local group. But Paul diligently preached to those body of Christ believers to be careful not to cause those Jews among them to stumble because they, uh, well, those converted little flock type Jews in Paul's meeting could still perish or be destroyed. And we'll look at verses that show that. If they did not endure to the end. They could perish, as we see in in, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 11. So, let's look at 1 Corinthians 8, 11. 8, 11. And through, uh, through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish. Perish. For whom Christ died. Um... It's talking about death there, perishing. 
through thy knowledge. And if you read the verses before that, it's somebody that knows, that's a body of Christ person like we are that believe the gospel of Christ, that Christ died for our sins. And yet they go and do things, you know, eating pork. Eating pork is not okay for those in that mixed group that were believing Israelites. Uh, and yet they could see some see a body of Christ person eating it, eating pork or whatever else is not permitting, a catfish, shrimp, whatever. Um, and they might try it themselves. And, and so it says, through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish. Or in Romans, if we look in Romans, they could be destroyed. Look at Romans uh, chapter 14, and we'll look at a couple verses there, verse 15 and verse 20. But if thy brother... See, they're called brothers because they both are built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being their Messiah that's going to rule on earth from the land for Israel and for the body of Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, risen from the dead, that died for our sins. So that by believing that Christ died for our sins, we're saved. So, he calls him brother. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. And then verse 20, For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eateth with offense. In other words, those Jewish believers that were mixed in with them, not meeting on their own meeting yet, having just come out of the Jewish synagogue because they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, um, they didn't have a loosening up of the law. They, you know, body of Christ people are not under the law, but. Paul was instructing them to to be accommodating, you know, be considerate. Don't, you know, you don't go into a, a room, well, like at the hospital even. When you go to a, a waiting room where people are all waiting for blood tests and they've been fasting for 24 hours, you don't go in there, you know, eating a submarine sandwich or something in front of them. But, you know, they're not going to die if they decide to take a bite of it. But... In that case, back then, if those Jews would decide to eat some pork, the believing Jews there among them, uh, they were the weaker brothers. They were in a weak position because they weren't yet saved. They had to endure to the end to, in the end, be saved. So they're the weak brothers, the ones with offense. So those are are likely to be the ones in Corinth who, of of whom or to whom Paul was saying. In 1 Corinthians 11.30, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. The ones that, that had, you know, eaten pork. I use pork just as one example. I mean, there's 613 laws, <laughs> or thereabouts. And uh, any one of those that they could be tempted to, uh, to breach would, would have caused this... In Acts 15, and in that period of time written about in Acts 15, when Peter, James, and John pledged to go to the circumcision and and to write, you know, also including their writings to write to the circumcision, they already understood the limits. It wasn't just people that descended physically from Jacob that were Jews. It wasn't just people that descended from Jacob, even narrower now, that were physically circumcised. Stephen's, remember Stephen in Acts 7? His preaching to the high priest, verse 1 in in chapter 7, shows the high priest was there participating in that blasphemous act. It, It clarifies it. He identified Israel's high priest the council mentioned in uh, the other ones mentioned late in chapter six. The council, the elders, the scribes, and the people in general were involved. The Israelites in general. He describes them as being uncircumcised in heart and ears, even though they clearly had descended from Jacob. But in God's eyes, they were, they were uncircumcised in heart and ears. And if we look in Jeremiah nine, 
<clears throat> look at Jeremiah 9, starting with verse 25. It, earlier, much earlier, this would be centuries earlier than Christ came. It's clarified, starting in verse 25 of Jeremiah 9. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. Egypt, verse 26, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness for the, all these nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart, in the heart. Paul also, back to the time of Acts, Paul de uh, clarifies it who is the true circumcision limited to? Narrows it down a little more. V uh, Romans 2.25 For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. If thou keep the law. Who has kept the law? Well, anyway, it goes on. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Well, that would fit everybody. So, in other words, Christ has considered them all under sin that he might show mercy on them all. And, and he sent his son to die for everybody's sins. So that if you believe on him, like those in Acts, in Ephesians 1.15, that Paul had to hear about before he wrote to them in Ephesus, uh, he says in Ephesians 1.7 that... We have, not they, not the other people, but we, those you believers and me, the, the believers have forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. We know that there's nobody, nobody even descended from Jacob, other than Jesus, that has kept the law all the time. But Paul limits it even further. Yet, when you get to... Uh, in fact, this was written before, but it limits it further when you when you read uh, Galatians three seven. Galatians three seven is what I'm looking for. Uh, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So only those who had the faith that was required of Israel were even considered the children of Abraham, the true circumcision. Now, that doesn't mean that Gentiles <laughs> that are of faith are now suddenly descended from Abraham. No, it's, it's only talking to Jews here. Only talking to Jews that came out of the synagogues that were in those meetings, Paul's meetings. So it's not saying that you and I can become a Jew or anything. It's misconstrued that way today, but that's not what it's talking about. It's saying you Jews... Uh, you know, therefore, that they which, the Jews which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. In other words, the rest aren't. Those disbelievers that are running the synagogues are not children of Abraham. They're not considered the circumcision. So, God provided the little flock for those who would believe, but... The rest of apostate Israel went off against God again, just like they'd been against God, uh, going after Moab, going after, uh, not Moab, um, uh, Baal, and uh, I don't remember, Raphim, um, Ishtar, not Ishtar, what's it in scripture, uh, Ashtar, uh, the uh, Zidonian fertility god, and uh, Molech, put their children through the fire, it says, burned their children uh, uh, unto these other false gods. They had gone astray so many times. And, you know, they, they're they going to catch theirs in at the uh, tribulation. The, the Lord says they will not be, how's it go? I will not leave them wholly unpunished. Israel's going to catch it too, as well as the rest of the nations, the nations around them that ganged up on them. So, uh, that discontinued Israel's great commission. They weren't to go to, to the, the uttermost parts of the world anymore, because those three pillars in the little flock had given it over to, to uh, Paul, Paul. 
to go to the world with the gospel of Christ, not with the kingdom gospel. They were to keep quiet about the kingdom gospel except to those true circumcision that were already meeting with them. No more Jewish evangelism. No more need for tongues to evangelize the non-Hebrew speaking Jews. There we go. So what it boils down to is that Peter, James, and John pledged to go to the true circumcision, the ones that were already expressing faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, raised from the dead. And that's the same faith in the name of Jesus, the identity of Jesus, that Paul preached according to Romans 10. But what saith it? Now he's talking about Israel and he's summing up uh, that they you know, why they didn't receive the kingdom, what they lacked. They'd done everything. I mean, they had kept the law. Well, let's go through the verse. Uh, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine, thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. Anybody that wanted to come to God, whether through the kingdom gospel or through Paul's gospel, had to believe had to believe something, had to have faith. And the, the gospel that Paul preached, that Israel also preached, was the gospel of God, that Jesus is the Son of God. Three things. First thing, that Jesus is the Son of God. Secondly, that he is the Messiah that had been prophesied. And thirdly, that he was resur resurrected from the dead, or risen from the dead. And it's called the gospel of God. We read it a few minutes ago, Romans 1, 1 through 4. Uh, but that is the gospel of God, those three facts. Let's look in Acts 17, verse 2, and we'll see how Paul used the gospel of God in his manner of operation, his mode of operation, you could call it. And we've read through this before, but look at, look at the result. It, it goes right into what we had talked about between then and now. Uh, starting in Acts 17, verse 2, uh, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, allege, opening and alleging, this is verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. There's the Messiahship. Verse 4 and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And there's the start of the meeting in, in uh, Thessalonica. This would be in Acts 17. There's the, the start of Paul's meeting. And while Peter, James, and John pledging to go to the true circumcision, Paul pledged to do what Christ sent him to do, to go to the heathen to those of the Gentiles, not necessarily the alien heathens, it doesn't say yet. Heathen just means uh, Gentiles or um, nations. And in some cases, I think it's translated families even. So, uh, it means other than the Jews, basically, though. So, Paul had pledged to do what Christ sent him to do, to go to the heathen. Those of the Gentiles to whom he had been sent by that time. And by the time of Acts 15, he had been sent out according to Acts 13, verses 2 and 4, and n not verse 3, which was their, the men there sending him out, which ended in Acts 14, 26. Just to clarify why we say verses 2 and 4, that's the general impact of the sending, but it did not end in Acts 14.26. It, it continued until Paul's later sending to all men. Uh, in practice, that meant that when Paul went to a town, he would seek out where the Jews and the Greeks met for a Sabbath meeting, and he would go to that meeting three weeks in a row and preach to them the gospel of God. Uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, risen from the dead. And those that did not believe it would stay in the synagogue. Those that did believe the identity of Jesus, the, the gospel of God, they would consort with Paul, as we just read. They would depart 
from the synagogue. Separate out from the synagogue. Uh, all terms used in the Bible about that process at that point in, in the procedure, Paul's mode of operation. And they would begin meeting with Paul and to study under Paul's preaching. Still, you know, not yet, uh, many of them not yet decided whether they were going to be believing Jews or believing body of Christ people in that, in that uh, meeting of Paul's. Paul was pretty aggressive, though. It didn't, probably didn't take too long uh, to make it clear what he was preaching. Those who had just started believing that Jesus is the Messiah and had left the synagogue where the start of, of two different subgroups uh, they they were that's what formed the, the start of that group that uh, temp, what do we call it temporary mixed group that left the synagogue and met with Paul at that time now there's no groups like that anymore don't get confused this is just during that time period that Acts 9 to Acts 28 uh, is the farthest outreach of it but uh, more likely Acts when is the first time that the Bible says Paul preached salvation would be in Acts 13, from Acts 13 till about uh, Acts 20, when when he got that call to go, the sending to go to all people. So it's a brief period, probably 12 to 25 years that this happened. But you've got scripture written here. People are taking it for today when it was only in the dispensation of the gospel to those people in the work at that time that that were trying to win over those people, those Jews, before the door slammed shut and Israel was cast away in Acts 28. So in that group of the two types of believers there, uh, both of which believed the gospel of God, the identity of Jesus, some of the believers God had called them to be body of Christ believers when they chose to believe Paul's gospel of Christ. Christ crucified for our sins, risen for our justification. So that subgroup was immediately baptized by one spirit into the one body of Christ as soon as they believed. So you've got people baptized by the spirit into not into water, into the body of Christ. That's the one baptism of Ephesians 4.4. 4. And additionally, that two-part group that left the synagogue, uh, trusting Paul's preaching of the gospel of God, who Jesus is, God had called some to be part of converted, believing, little flock of Israel, Israel of God people. And uh, we, we had talked about this before, so... But that's what Paul preached in those verses we read in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 to 20. And I'm just going to read verse 18 here for a refresher. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. And it was only to those Jews and Greeks quitting the synagogue that these were, these, this was talking about. And that God had called in uncircumcision, to whom Paul preached the gospel of Christ, crucif crucified for our sins, the gospel of salvation. And he went on, uh, as in Corinth, uh, he wrote back to them and he told them about their salvation uh, in the first chapter, verses, what, 17 through 25 or so, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 to 25, but then in more detail, probably the most detail that he, he wrote about would be in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. So when he was there in Acts 18, he preached this gospel to them, and he's saying, I'm declaring it to you again. He says what happened when he preached it to them at the, in Corinth. He says, you have received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. So it's the gospel that saves people. It's the gospel of salvation. And he says, there's a, a, a condition here if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. In other words, if you're trying to get saved by Peter's gospel or James, it, it doesn't work anymore. The, by that point in Acts 
19 when he wrote 1 Corinthians, the only way to be saved was by what Paul preached unto them. Not what Peter had preached or any of the others. Uh, and not the little flock. Not people that heard what Jesus preached to Israel only about the kingdom, the kingdom gospel. Uh, that doesn't work anymore. They'd gotten past Acts 7. Israel had fallen. And God had started a new pattern of salvation in Acts 9 with the salvation of Paul. We can only be saved today the way Paul was, as a sinner. As a sinner. Not as a law keeper. Not as someone uh, trying to be good enough for God. <laughs> if someone trying to be good enough for God doesn't understand how good God is or how sinful man is. But uh, going on with the verse, uh, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, and here it is what's to be believed, it's not just faith in general that there's a God, but what he says here is what, what is to be believed to be saved, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. So he had to receive it. That's what happened on the Damascus Road. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures he says uh, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received but that's the only way to come to him now he said I am chief in verse in first uh, Timothy 1 15 and 16 he says uh, it's a faithful saying Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am well he uses the word protos which means first in line it's translated there chief but it's in the next verse 2 verse 16 it says how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first there's that word protos Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern well that fits right in that it, if it was the first time it's the start of a pattern for a pattern to them which should hereafter here's what you do if you're going to follow that pattern believe on him on Jesus Christ to life everlasting believe that he died for your sins and that that's how Paul having just committed an unforgivable sin that was for Israel it was an uncom unforgivable sin that's how he could be saved he couldn't be saved into Israel or with Israel's doctrine. Jesus Christ did not just wave a magic wand over Paul's unforgivableness. Jesus Christ became Paul's sin, Saul of Tarsus's sin, and died Paul's death. So, and that's what he does for us. That be, be, uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, Be ye followers of me as I am of God. In other words, you want to come to God? you got to come to God the way I did. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Eventually, those two subgroups that would come out of the synagogues would have to split from each other, and the little flock, Church of God, would meet on the Sabbath, separate from the apostate, unbelieving synagogue. And the body of Christ believers would meet whenever they could, sometimes on the first day of the week, uh, hinted at in Acts 20 verse 7 but not by any law that they had to uh, they would study the epistles that Paul wrote to them you know those epistles had been passed around by then uh, according to Colossians uh, and, and you know they shared with the letter that Paul wrote to Laodicea it came to them and they switched letters and it had been passed around and, of course, they wouldn't send... <laughs> would you send the original, or would you make a copy and keep the original? So the copies were made, and it was sent all around. So the, the scriptures were available then. Even the latest scriptures written, the ones written by Paul. So before the canon of scripture was complete and available, the Body of Christ churches had Body of Christ prophets and brought body of Christ teachers. And God gave the body of Christ prophets all knowledge and understanding of the mystery. You can, well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries. 
That's what God gave them, the understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So, but it does, within the verse, it does define what the gift, body of Christ gift of prophecy was. This is not talking about Isaiah and Moses and those Old Testament prophets that wrote down what, what God said was, was happening or would have happened or was going to happen. Uh, professed what God wanted them to profess. The body of Christ prophets, uh, their commission was to acknowledge that the things that Paul wrote were commanded of him by God. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 14.37, and we'll close with this. If any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So that was the job of the prophets to, uh, what is the term I'm looking for? Confirm, validate, uh, second, <laughs> you know, I, I second that. Uh, they were to provide additional uh, b belief, a reason to believe for the listeners that Paul was receiving inspirations from God to write down and that the epistles that he wrote were the inspired word of God. Newly inspired. It was new scripture. That's what we're talking about with the prophets and the teachers. We're talking about new scripture being sent from God to man through Paul. And that's why that one of the steps was uh, from, God, from Christ to Paul and then from Paul to the men in the assembly. And then the men were to tell their wives. They were to be family units. And the, the, the wives were to hear from the men. If they had a, any question, let them ask their husbands at home, it says. And they're not allowed to teach these new revelations. Uh, they were to... <laughs> that doesn't apply. We're not receiving new revelations today, are we? Thank the Lord. Uh, that restriction was for the, a dispensation of the gospel. And we're in the dispensation of the grace of God. So that's, that doesn't apply. That particular part doesn't apply. Uh, women, uh, often women would serve and they'd be blamed for, uh, you know, serving is another word for ministering. They'd be blamed for, for preaching or teaching as if any teaching of God or professing of God's word was restricted from women. And yet it was restricted that they teach not these new revelations before it was revealed from Christ to Paul to the men in the, in the assembly and then to the women. The women had, the, had a special, and we'll get into this more in, in other lessons, uh, but they had a special uh, privilege and calling. The men weren't, <laughs> weren't there to, to uh, pass on this new scripture and new doctrines to the next generation. That's the women's job. They, you know, without the women, it would have died in one generation. So the women are to teach the younger women. They're to teach their children. Uh, and the men receive the revelations from Paul. But that all has to do with the bringing to man of these new scriptures, which ended centuries and over a millennium ago. So, you know, it's... It's like whether we can eat pork or not in front of Jews. You know, it, it just doesn't apply anymore. There's no connection with what was written. I mean, the reason for Paul writing that has been gone for centuries. All right, well, I'm done.